we will get to that first, but I want to start in your wheelhouse because I'm about to say something that we haven't said, oh, I don't know, in about 17 years. Alabama has a problem. And by have a problem, I'm going to say three things. One, they've tried it out three quarterbacks, can't find one they like. Their offensive line has issues, and they needed a late interception to get out of Tampa alive. Man, I agree. Um, I, I think right now uh, you you have to say that the Tommy Reese hire has been a complete and total failure. Uh, I mean, what Tommy Reese is doing is is coaching malpractice. I, I've never seen anything like it. And I know I realize Nick Saban is there uh, and I'm, I'm not trying to deflect the blame from him. But Reese is the offensive coordinator, and he is in charge of that offense. And there's not there's not much he can do about the offensive line other than find a quarterback that can mask the problems. And, and he had that quarterback. As, as much as we can criticize Jalen Milrow and say, well, Jalen Milrow may not be able to get Alabama to a national championship, I don't think that's the issue any longer. I, I think it's uh, salvaging this season. And you know, without injury, the idea that we were that we we had we have seen three quarterbacks in a very quick uh, two week period it is unprecedented. Uh, and it's quite frankly embarrassing. Uh, and because that means that the coaching staff, you know, completely has misfired. Uh, and, you know, there is no easy solution when, when you make as many mistakes as they have, uh, but they better find something pretty quickly because they go up against a, a dynamic offense and a, a pretty good defense this week. So, I was stunned that they didn't have a package for Milrow at all yesterday at all. Like, right. Hey, Reese come up with 15 ball plays in a game where you couldn't do anything and weather that sucked to get the guy that's more athletic exactly. to come out exactly. there. I have a theory and this is complete speculation in a theory. My theory is that Saban went with Buckner because he was he came with the offensive coordinator and it was like, all right, well, this is your offense. This is your quarterback. We're going to give it a shot. My theory is that he's completely already moved on from both. Like, hey, man, your, your quarterback's not seeing the field again. All right, so he's out. And then Ty Simpson didn't look. I, I just can't figure out what they were doing with the fact that you've got a guy that you at least know is athletic. Like, Help me understand this. Well, no, uh, Matt, there is no way, easy way to understand it. Um, I mean, I have I have friends that are calling for the fourth string quarterback who's a, a promising freshman. I mean, that's how ridiculous this is. But, but I mean, I sat with Nick Saban in Nashville, and I have never heard a guy profess more love for a coach than he did for Tommy Reese. And I, I mean, I, I'm not going to get too deep into the psychological uh, world, but I mean, he he really believed it. He saw something in this guy. Uh, and and I, I don't know what Nick Saban really see you know saw in him uh, because I mean I, I've seen the same quarterback uh, I mean I'm, he saw much more of Buckner than we did and I agree with you I mean I'm, I'm not I'm telling Buckner go find another school uh, I can't take a chance on you again uh, and you know, the only thing I, I I could theorize is that Milrow handled his uh, demotion poorly and Saban was sending a message but what what he really has to worry about now Matt is that locker room. Uh, you know it, and, and everyone watching and listening knows that the players look to a quarterback. That's the leader. And now you have just completely made a disaster out of the most important position. Uh, and this is two weeks after everyone, including uh, including us, we, we were praising Milrow after one week. So, uh, I mean, he, he didn't become the greatest coach of all time by accident. Uh, and, and the clock is is ticking for him to save the season. And and what really is even more disturbing to some of my friends who who watch these things is that Saban, Matt, you know, he he kind of looks like a grandfather at his at his uh, at his, at his, at his grandson's little league uh, games. And the, you know, the guy drops a pop fly and costs him the uh, the division, and he walks up and hugs him and says, "I'm proud of you guys." I mean, that's exactly what he said after the game. I'm, I'm proud of the way they fought back. Other than the fact that it was the worst uh, performance Alabama has had in a win, yeah, in 17 years. Uh, I mean, people were comparing it to the the 2007 
lost to Louisiana Monroe. I mean, that's how that's the context of how bad this was for Alabama. Yeah. And you wonder if they're going to be able to flip that Alabama switch now that they're going to get heavily into conference and Ole Miss coming up next. That's going to be one to watch, because if you're asking me to compare these two teams, Ole Miss looks I mean, they've got their quarterback and Jackson Dart. They've got their stuff figured out. And, you know, I, I just don't. I didn't think we'd say, I mean, this is a guy I said this on college football final at some point during television yesterday. This is a coach in a school coming off to a tongue of Iloa first round pick Mac Jones, first round pick Bryce young, number one, number one, overall pick. And now yeah. you've got, you've got three yeah, guys Jalen hurts on the front end of that. Yeah, exactly. So who knows with Alabama, but what I know about the tide is you're about to figure it out real, real quick. And I can't believe I'm about to say this, but you, you take this wherever you want, but I'm just going to give you an umbrella of stuff between how Florida just absolutely beat the hell out of Tennessee at the swamp between Georgia having struggled to get South Carolina out of their way, having Arkansas lose it home to BYU, who's slightly above average to Texas A&M already having a loss to LSU looking really good against Mississippi state, but already losing to Florida state. We just discussed Alabama, Paul. I don't know that the sec is in the top two or three of conferences in college football right now. I just don't. And uh, when, when Vanderbilt lost to UNLV, uh, the school tweeted out, it just means more. Um, yeah. It's, I, I mean, I've, I have tried to uh, not to overreact to this, but 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 at this point, we, we have a good sample. Uh, we're no longer week one, week two. We have three weeks, and and this is this is a, a serious trend line. Uh, I think the Georgia thing is a little perplexing, and and I, I think that's what happens when you just you just fall asleep the first two weeks, and then you look you look at the, you look at the line on your phone, and you go, okay, well we're we're we're, we're supposed to beat this team badly, and. Uh, I mean, they, they I, I believe Georgia will, will recover pretty well from this. But after that, uh, thank goodness for Missouri. Uh, and by the way, can you imagine if assuming we ever got to Missouri, had they had it lost to Kansas State, the, the clock management of, oh. of Eli Drinkwitz would have been one of the biggest topics in college football. He got bailed out by a 61 year, year, yard field goal, which would have made this even worse. By the way, the less, the less miles is strong in him, by the way. Yeah. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I, I, I need to walk gingerly uh, here, uh, Matt, because you know, my main job is promoting the Southeastern conference and how great the football is. And, and I cannot be party to uh, any of you, uh, you know, Easterners trying to get me to uh, agree with anything you say. Yeah, well, look, the, I'm a born and raised Pac-12, er so at least I can brag on that conference for a minute. But I mean, I was sitting, we were sitting there yesterday, and we were trying to get someone to tell, like, what's the SEC done? Give me something. 